Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a weekly Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a show that focuses on what's going on in the world of the Beatles, news-wise. I'm Ken Michaels, best known for my syndicated radio program on the Beatles called Every Little Thing, being joined by the man who writes for Beatles Examiner and many Examiner columns, and that, of course, is Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everybody. Today's show, we're going to be doing something on Wings Over America. And before we even start, I just want to say that this is a crazy time, uh, a bit of a crazy time, a busy time in the career of Paul McCartney because Wings Over America is about to be remastered, and probably by the time this gets posted or airs, it'll already be out. And in addition to that, Rock Show, his film of the concert from the Wings Over America tour, is being shown in a limited run in theaters and will be coming out on DVD. In addition to all that, there's his current tour, the Out There Tour. His birthday is coming up June 18th, so there's a lot of things going on. And we're going to do either a show or maybe several shows on Wings Over America and Rock Show as reviews. But I thought what we would do first off is just talk about the Wings Over America Tour. And in my opinion, and we'll certainly get your take on this, Steve, I think this was a pivotal moment in Paul's post-Beatles career, a very significant moment, very important. How do you feel about this particular time and this tour in Paul's career? Well, as much as I love the current band, and I think the current band does a great job, Wings was indeed very pivotal, and they were, I mean, I think Wings was probably one of Paul's strongest periods, if not the strongest period you know, uh, creatively for Paul, um, both live and and in the studio. I mean, live they were just they were just absolutely fantastic. As you know, anyone who's heard Wings Over America knows. And um, I know we're not we're not going to review it, but I mean, I, you and I have both been listening to promos, and I mean, it's such a great group, and they they were just so smooth and together. And um, but yeah, I mean, it's just uh, you know. The Denny Lane factor, I think, was a big part of that. Sure, you know, Denny had Denny had a lot to a lot to do with that. Uh, how you know how great they were, but they're you know they're and and I mean Den, Denny was the you know and then there was the the different members as you know that came in later. But I mean, yeah, Wings is just a, a, a very strong period in Paul's in Paul's uh, life. Well, it's interesting. They went through several group changes, and depending upon who you talk to. Uh, different fans have different opinions as to what their favorite lineup was of Wings. Uh, just recently, I interviewed Jeff Slate, who you know and many mm-hmm. fans know, a New York musician who has a band called Birds of Paradox, which coincidentally uh, released a new CD not long ago, which features Lawrence Juber and Steve Holly of Wings, as well as two of the members of Elephant's Memory, right? Uh, Gary Van Syok and Adam Ippolito. And Jeff said to me, by far and away, he loves the last lineup of Wings the most. But that's like a side note here. I'm not just talking about Wings in general. I'm talking about this particular moment in time, 1975 and 76, when he did this tour. And for me, when I look back at this, obviously it was such a different time from what Paul has done since the 89-90 tours, which have been primarily based on Beatles material. Not all, but I mean... After so many years of staying away from the Beatles and only doing just you know, a few songs in his tours on them, that was his time to finally acknowledge the greatness of that catalog and to bring it out. But ever since then, it's been very heavily weighted in Beatles material. If you go back to this particular tour, and for that matter, the earlier tours of Wings, and what was to follow in 79, it's mainly solo music. The solo music of that time. And... When I look back at this particular time, it's a time that I cherish the most because Paul, not necessarily artistically, that's a whole other issue, but certainly commercially was at the top of his game then. Radio stations in America, and believe me, I listened to the radio religiously back then. They were playing him quite a lot, and not just on Top 40 radio. He was played on rock stations. Right. It wasn't just the singles that, that got airplay at that time. It wasn't just silly love songs and let him in. Rock stations were playing Beware of My Love. They were playing Time to Hide. They were playing Medicine Jar. They were playing Magneto and Titanium Man. And he was, he was doing all sorts of things 
at the time. Uh, I, I mean, stretching out, doing all sorts of things. The TV special is a good example of that. Um, there were all sorts of different things happening in that TV special. One thing we didn't mention as we started talking about this is Linda. And, I, and I'm and i sure there are people out there going, why didn't they say anything about Linda? Because uh, cause Linda you know, initially was not appreciated very much, but I think, uh, and not just because she's no longer around. I mean, Linda's really, uh, her status has really grown, and people appreciate her a lot more now mm-hmm. um, for what she brought to Wings. And I know, you know, there was uh, everybody remembers that uh, that tape that, that got out of of Linda singing "Hey Jude," and uh, and all the, you know, all the. Uh, I mean, that caused. I mean, that was even before there was an internet, and it caused all sorts of a sens- sensation at the time. And you know, um, but uh, she was she was uh, fantastic. I mean, she she brought so much to to Paul's music, and um, and I know, I mean. He really treasures that now, and I think that's an underlying reason. He's not saying it, but it's an underlying reason why Rock Show and Wings Over America are coming out because of her. Well, I think it has to come out when you're remastering a catalog. That's too big a, a part of his career. Right, was this particular tour, and I definitely, think he, I, I yeah. think he really treasures though that time because of that. Uh, I think that's. Uh, like I said, I think there's a there's an underlying reason that these are coming out. Granted, this is this is a major part of his catalog. There's no question about it. But I think uh, with the fact that he's been doing, for example, he's been doing My Love and dedicating it directly to her when mm-hmm. he's on stage. You know, I think there's a a memory there that he that he can't forget. And I, and not that you would expect him to, but I mean, he really treasures that time with Linda and what she and uh, in essence, what she brought to that group. So it's I think interesting. this is partially a tribute to her, too. It's interesting that you bring that up. First of all, Linda, Linda deserves a lot of credit. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I don't think anybody would say she was a great keyboard player, but she played what was necessary. She learned the parts. But more importantly, she added so much to the harmonies of Wings Records. And uh, definitely, you know, at that time... Early on, even leading up to the Wings Over America tour, the media were still harping on her, why is she in the band? And mm-hmm. Paul always had to keep defending her. But she really did add a lot to the sound of Wings. She didn't do anything to harm the music. And not only with Wings, but even his post-Wings music. Her, I, her I, vocals I, are a very big part of Paul's sound. And I often, I often have to wonder, and you might say that this is going a bit too far, but sometimes I wonder if... Paul doesn't go back enough to the Wings material because he can't duplicate that same sound. You know, there are certain songs, especially like Silly Love Songs or With Little Luck, where her presence is so felt on the recordings. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, you can get the guys in this band to harmonize with Paul, but it's not the same sound. It was a very big part of the Wings sound and, and to a lot of his solo music. They've done, and I can't remember which song it is, but I know they've done... Uh, a couple of songs on stage with the recent group that you've heard that kind of Linda, I guess Abe's the one that has the high harmonies and uh, and and so they've kind of, there's been notice that that uh, that sound is there, uh, but um, she was amazing. She really was. She uh, well, everything she brought. I remember when I saw them in '89, they sang um, um, uh, "Figure of Eight at the beginning, and she yelled out. As the, as the song was starting, just as they got into the song, she yelled out, "Yeah!" and right over the band and everything. And <laughs> it was it was it was kind of funny at the time because you know it was this stark voice that said, "Yeah," you know. And but her she had such a great enthusiasm, and 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 she brought that and everything, you know. And that was a lot of what she brought to to Wings too. She brought a fun element to right. the group. Yeah. And when I look back at this particular time, I'm also reminded of. This gradual buildup in Paul's career, how he was gaining momentum every single year. Because if you recall, going back to the very first Wings album, Wildlife, it was called Wings. Mm-hmm. It wasn't called Paul McCartney and Wings. Right. And it went to number 10 in America, which wasn't great. I'm sure they expected better. But for a while there, because it was called Wings, to help the record sell, they gradually made it Paul McCartney and Wings. 
Right. You know, Band on the Run was Paul McCartney and Wings. Actually, Red Rose Speedway was a Paul McCartney and Wings album, not a Wings album. Right. But as his record sold more and more, and certainly with the success of Band on the Run, then all of a sudden Venus and Mars was not Paul McCartney and Wings, it was Wings. Wings at the Speed of Sound was a Wings album, not yeah. Paul McCartney and Wings. So you could see how Wings was getting more and more of an identity. And like I said before, radio stations were playing songs. I mentioned Medicine Jar, I, meant, I mentioned uh, Time to Hide. They were playing songs that were not just Paul vocals. So when I was a teenager seeing this show at Madison Square Garden, I was wondering how much would Denny get to sing? How much would Jimmy get to sing? Would Joe right. get to do Must Do Something About It from Wings to the Speed of Sound? Because he did a great job vocally on that song. You know, and that was a part of it. I thought of them as a group. I didn't just go to see Paul McCartney. And and that may, you know, that's a big difference between then and now. If there's one thing you can say between then and now, it's that the current group is not the same kind of group that Wings was. It's not the same unit. The, unit, the group now is Paul McCartney and Friends, uh -huh. whereas Wings was was Wings. There's no question about it. Right. Whatever lineup Paul had at that time in Wings, that was the band that he took on the road. Whereas the band that he has now, he utilizes them when he needs them. They haven't really done that much in the studio together, despite the fact that they've worked with Paul now for for 10 plus years. You know, they haven't done that much. They may be on this new album that he's working on. We don't really know at this point. I, we, I'm hearing that that they are, okay, at least in some respect. But that, you know, we won't know for sure until the album comes out. But the very nature of the fact that at this time in Paul's career, he did a set list where there was only five Beatles songs in the entire set list. All the rest was relatively new material, not just hits, but album cuts. And playing songs that weren't just Paul McCartney vocals. I mean, he could do no wrong at this point. I, rep I look at this as being like the pinnacle of Paul's solo career in the commercial sense. Not artistically, necessarily, but commercially. Because he was really accepted at this point. As I said, he was building momentum. Certainly from 1973 on, he had a whole string of hit hits there. He had a lot of number ones. You know, and his albums all went to number one from Red Rose Speedway on. Well, remember, too, that, uh, you know, the Beatle breakup was still kind of fresh in his mind, and I think, you know, that had a lot to do with it. That, I don't really think so. I mean, really? Because, I, I mean, I can't... That's the only reason to me not to play Beatles songs is that... And to promote your solo career is that... Oh, know, yes. He, you know, I, I, what you're trying to say is the reason why he didn't play Beatles songs was because of the Beatle breakup mm -hmm. being so new. Yes, I agree with that. But I think that at that time, that first half of the 70s, all four Beatles were really trying to gain an identity on their own. Right. It mattered a lot to all four of them in their own way. And they all handled it differently. And he, and he when he did play Beatles songs... The di there's a kind of a difference between then and now. There's kind of a detachment, I think, in the Wings versions, where there isn't now. There's more of a. I think he embraces the the Beatles songs a lot more, not because he just because he does them more, but in the way he the way he does them. If you listen to the to the vocals on some of those live Wings tracks, there just seems to, like I said, a detachment. He just he's not. Trying, I don't know, I, I, I hate to, I don't want to say he wasn't trying hard, but it just it seems that way. I don't know. I don't know if I hear it that way. You know, I just know that in his mind at that time, he was thinking the present. The last thing on his mind probably was a Beatles reunion or anything that had to do with the Beatles. He well, was there. A, that, that makes sense then. I mean, that, that's probably a better explanation to why he was doing it that way. But... But the way that Paul handled himself was so different from the other Beatles because certainly in the early part of the 70s, the critics really, they kind of despised Paul mm -hmm. because uh, some of them looked at him as being a big reason for the breakup, especially if you watch the Let It Be film. Some people look at that and say, what, what an egomaniac. He's the only one 
you know, leading the group or the cameras all on him. Right. And, you know, you had all that kind of vibe going on back then. Right. And the fact that he sued the other Beatles, you know, in the public eye didn't give him a good image. So the critics were really down on him early on, especially, and a lot of fans feel this way about the Ram album, that, you know, he was ripped apart for that album when it came out. And fans through the years have defended Ram. Mm -hmm. And even more so now than ever, they appreciate Ram as being one of his strongest albums. I think the ironic thing about that period is that of the four of them, probably Ringo was the one that was getting the, uh, the best press. And and uh, and Paul and you're right. I think Paul was getting, you know, it was pretty bad for him. Uh, his image, his image, took a pretty bad beating because of the breakup. So it took a lot for him to build his image back up, but it was a gradual thing. He did things the old-fashioned way. Mm -hmm. He took a band, had them play small gigs, worked themselves up to bigger venues, and he waited till he had enough strong and successful material before he came to America and toured the world and did a two and a half hour show. He did it in, in a very smart way. But, you know, when I look back at this tour, like I said, I can't emphasize this enough. He was getting airplay on Top 40 radio. He's getting airplay on rock radio. They weren't just playing Paul songs. They were playing Denny Lane songs. And if you look at this tour, there's actually a handful of songs that Denny sang lead to. Right. You look at Paul, from 1989-90 on, there's very little from the other band members and with their contribution. None. Yeah, it's it's all Paul now. Right. But you go back to 75 and 76, you got Denny Lane singing Go Now. He's mm -hmm. singing Time to Hide. He's singing the beginning of, um, well, the verses of uh, Picasso's Last Words. He's singing Richard Corey. Right. You know, there's a lot of Denny Lane on this album. Right. And you got Jimmy doing Medicine Jar. So it's his way of representing this band as a band. Right. You're not going just to see Paul. And as I said before, there was an ongoing joke at the time. Did you know Paul McCartney was in a band before Wings? Well, there was a whole new generation of fans out there that discovered Wings and Paul without really knowing his Beatle past, as hard as that is to believe. No, it's not that hard to believe, really, because that... that that joke still is around, and, and a lot of people, there are a lot of people that don't know know his Beatle path even now. I mean, I, I think there's people that, that have, you know, that like him that really don't know that much about the Beatles. It's, it's kind of funny. I don't um, know of anyone that knows his solo music and knows very little Beatles. You know, it usually goes hand in hand. But in the 70s, because he got this airplay, this intense airplay, Mm-hmm there was a whole new generation of fans that got exposed to it. Right. And for that reason alone, and it also applied to the other Beatles too, just more so with Paul. I still believe that there were some people who discovered John through Walls and Bridges, you know, believe it or not, hearing whatever gets you through the night. There might, there might have been a lot of teenagers then that didn't know John Lennon was in the Beatles. Believe it or not, as hard as that is to believe. I know. That's, same, that is... You know, but just by the exposure... On different formats of radio, if you're young and you're not exposed to the Beatles or you're, you're uh, not old enough to remember when the Beatles had their that heyday in the 60s, mm -hmm. and it's the 70s and all this music's being played on Top 40 radio, whether it's My Sweet Lord, whether it's Uncle Albert, you know, if you're a little kid growing up hearing that music and you don't know the Beatles, Paul McCartney's a new person to you. Yeah. So there was a generation of fans that grew up hearing the solo Beatle music and I will say more with Paul because he had more commercial success than the others, although they all had certain degrees of commercial success. But the fact that he had this whole new identity back then, whereas now, you know, he has had success in other ways. He's had his own triumphs through the decades for achieving so many other things, whether it's one successful tour after another or whether it's his success with his classical music, whatever you want to call it. He's had all kinds of different levels of success in different areas. Right. But as far as commercial success, being at the top of your game, where you can command and do basically what you want to do live. I mean, we just did a show on Paul's current set list on the Out There Tour. Right. 
And after we did that show, as I do very often, I think to myself, I should have said this. <laughs> I don't know if that happens to you. But, yeah, it, it does. It does. But I really wish, and this is just a personal wish of mine, it probably never will happen anyway, that if Paul could ever do a tour, if, what I would like him to do more than anything else is to do a tour where he does songs that he wants without thinking at all what his fans want. What would be the songs in his catalog that he's very proud of, whether it's Beatles, whether it's solo, without giving any thought for, you know, saying to yourself, I got to do Hey Jude, I got to do Let It Be, I got to do Band on the Run, you know. Back then, this is what he did. Yeah. This is what he wanted to do. He didn't well, think to himself, I have to do certain songs. Mm -hmm. He did well, what he wanted to do to represent this band, and that's kind of why I missed this tour. And don't get me wrong, I've loved all of Paul McCartney's tours, every single one of them. Right. But this was the only time in his career, apart from the earlier tours of Wings, when they first started out, and a lot of those shows were just an hour. I'm talking about when he built himself up to two-and-a-half-hour shows, which he is still doing to this day. This is the only time when he really did what he wanted to do, I think, in his heart. Although maybe you could argue the point that after all these years, he always was proud of the Beatles, and now he's finally getting a chance, I shouldn't say finally, since 8990, to showcase that love for those songs. Well, I, th I think I'm going to disagree with you a little bit there. That's fine. You ready, you ready for that? Um, you can do that. Yeah. I, <laughs> I wish I think, you would. <laughs> I think, as opposed to the beginning, when he didn't want to play the Beatles songs, he and Bo Ringo both are more comfortable with the past than they were, than than he was back then, and I think that's part of it too. I think that he wasn't as comfortable playing the Beatles songs because, and getting back to what we said about the breakup, I think that had something to do with it. There's you know all the all the bitterness and everything like that, and I you know, and time time has healed all that, and he and and history is the Beatles are our history, our big history now. They weren't the big history that they were, you know, with Wings when, during the Wings era. They're they're right. monumental now. They grow more in stature with every right. year. Exactly. So, you know, that makes it a little easier to do. And um, and also, I mean, not, all, not to mention the, the money is there. So, I mean, for that reason, that's what's going on there. I don't, I think, I don't think money has anything to do with it at this point. Well, whatever. Um, <laughs> but uh, a couple of other points. Um, one of my, my weird theories is that the reason Linda came into the band was because John brought Yoko in. So John, when John decided to, to make Yoko his musical partner, Paul decided Linda would do the same for him. And I don't know that, you know, you can say the, the qualifications of both are, are a little, you know, tenuous, um, depending on how much you like Yoko's, you know, uh, Yoko's music. Um, but Linda was an absolute stranger to mu to this kind of you know to performing music. She knew how to shoot music with a camera, but mm -hmm. you know it, performing was a different situation. And he ended up making her very much a part of the band. You know, using her to more than the best of her abilities, and to the fact where she was accepted. And you know, for that you have to give him. Um, a lot of credit. There was one other thing I was going to say is that he had, there was a, a I had written a, a year or so ago a suggestion that he start doing full albums in concert with the uh -huh. I, idea of doing Wings albums. And he did answer that uh, at a, in a q and A. I don't know if it, it was because of my question or it was because of somebody else's question, but he said he, he wouldn't consider doing it, which I think to this day is is a shame that he will not do that it'd be great if he pulled uh say band on the run or you know uh, and decided to do that whole album or one of the the wings albums uh, i think that would be fantastic and i think people would absolutely love it but okay. i think it's... that he's uh, again now i think we've gone the other way he doesn't want he's afraid to leave the beatles albums because he's afraid that people are going to go how come you're not doing beatles and you know, that's too bad, because uh, I think that would be a lot of fun. 
Well, you said a lot of things there, and I want to try and comment okay. on each of them. But um, I think it's quite possible what you said about Linda. The the reason why Paul brought Linda in is because John brought Yoko in. That's possible. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's all that relevant. I just know that in the case of Linda, she played such a big part in the sound of his music and did, did a great job. I, I think it was an experiment that worked worked better than, I, I don't want to say he planned, but it is an experiment that worked, let's put it that way. Yeah, um, I will agree with you there. Um, as far as the Beatles about Paul and Ringo being comfortable in their own skin, I absolutely agree with you there. And they should be. They should be so proud of their Beatle past. I'm just wondering that if Paul had the choice at this point to do a show that he wanted to do, where he picked the music and he didn't care at all what the what the fans thought, what would it be, how much of it would be Beatles, how much of it would be solo. There's so much great music that he's overlooked from his solo career. Uh, you know, I would be most curious as a fan to know in his heart what he's most proud of as far as his entire body of work is concerned. Instead of thinking that there are certain songs that you have to do no matter what. There are certain artists that do just that. You know, Todd Rundgren is someone that I'm a major fan of. And he's someone that every single time he tours, he does a different tour. And you never know what he's going to do. And you don't know if he's going to have a band, or if he's going to be solo, if he's going to play to a backing track. You don't know what his material is going to be. He may focus on his newest album and do very little else. You know, he may abandon all the, the hits that he's known for. He does what he wants, and his fans love him for that because he's an individual. You know, I'm not saying Paul should be that. I just, I think he cares a little bit too much what his fans want. And maybe we should be happy with that. I don't know. Well, I just wish I knew in his heart what, what music he'd like to be known for that maybe hasn't been given the attention that it should I instead of just could... doing the hits the same songs. I think you could say, in general, concert tours today are way too regimented. Look at what the Stones are doing now. You know, they're basically doing. I think they're basically doing the. I haven't. I have to say, I haven't followed the the Stones set list every night. But I mean, they basically do the same stuff every night, uh, and just about everybody else's. Nobody really plugs that kind of that kind of uh, you know really putting on a, a show. It has to be pretty much decided ahead of time, and they do the same set list. You know, a lot of, a lot of people do the same set list every night, which is really too bad. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I think I think uh, Paul could have a lot of fun with that, especially with that band, with the current band, doing that because they are very capable. And uh, but uh, it doesn't look like it's going to happen, at least not for now. Right. But anyway, this was a magical time. I think, the Wings Over America tour. And, and I really, you know, I cherish this time in mm -hmm. his career. And I, I by, by the same token, I'm not saying this was his best material in his solo career because he's done amazing stuff in every decade, which I wish he would showcase more. But, you know, it's like I said when we reviewed his current playlist, there's no way you can please everybody. Right. You have real loyal fans who have followed everything he's ever done that are probably thinking, why doesn't he ever do anything from Press to Play? Why doesn't he ever do anything from Tug of War, except for here today? You know, uh, there are those fans who want something represented from different periods. Right. And um, this was an incredible time in, in Paul's career, and I wish that, uh, you know, radio continued to play him in the decades that followed the same way that they did in the 70s, but radio went through a lot of changes, and it's... It's a whole other animal these days. Yep. So this yep. tour represented not only the pinnacle, I think, commercially of Paul's career, but also reflected what radio was like at that time. Right. So that will put a halt to this show. We welcome your comments. You can write to us at thingswesaidtodayradioshow at gmail.com. If you'd like to get in touch with Steve, all you got to do is tell him, Steve. My email is beatlesexaminer at gmail dot com. Feel free to write to me and say what say anything you like, uh, you know, opinions or whatever, and be glad to. Uh, very responsive. I I will respond to you. Okay, and uh, also you can like us on our own Facebook page at Things We Said Today. You just developed a brand new Facebook page for Paul's Out There tour, and yep. what's it called? It's called uh, Paul McCartney Out There. Uh, news 2013, and we've been posting news, and, and uh, hopefully once uh, the tour drops in Orlando, we'll start getting people talking about the shows, 
and we've got a few hundred people that uh, like us, and uh, come join us and join the party. Right, and if you want to get in touch with me, you can write to me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. You should also, if you can, check out my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com, with lots of interviews with people in the Beatle world, plus Beatles trivia and prizes given out every single week. That's at uh, kenmichaelsradio.com. And don't miss my columns at Beatles Examiner and, uh, and all my other examiners, but Beatles Examiner for sure. So, for things we said today, this is Ken Michael saying thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>